Jau rangiti rama, a te na kato kato, a te na kato kua hui hui mai nei kite nei hui, te di to di to, 2017. Um, we are here today to talk about um, a project that we've been working on in, in Superu called uh, Bridging Cultural Perspectives. Um, one of the other things that I want to want to do is to acknowledge the presence of, um, of those who have contributed some thinking to, to some of this work, some thinking to, to knowledge systems and bodies of knowledge. I want to acknowledge um, uh, Matua Whatarangi um, for the work that you've done around um, Galileo's um, knowledge and also the Maturanga Māori continuum. Um, <coughs> I also want to acknowledge um, Ta Mason Jury for the work that he's also done in science and the interface of indigenous knowledges. Um, I want to acknowledge um, Sonia, Sonia McFarlane. I'm not sure whether Sonia is in the room at the moment, but Sonia is, has been quite a strong part of, of this work as well. Um, I also want to acknowledge Cathy Irwin, who was involved in a lot of this work when she was at um, the Families Commission. Kia ora no atu. Um, right. Right. Click. Which one? I think it's the green one. Yes. Right. Now, some of the themes that have been coming... Um, some of the themes throughout this we have been around um, partnership, um, relationships, um, responsiveness, uh, but also about Fano, Hapu, Iwi, Māori knowing knowing best, um, which brings us to to the to this question up here, um, and I'm just going to step over here so I can read that. Oh, how can how can we shift and shape the way government develops responsive policies and programs with Māori and with other diverse populations in Aotearoa New Zealand. Um, right, I'm just going to move that along, OK? I just wanted to say something about the... Um, just draw on some of the, the literature and the thinking that's actually informed us around this project. I want to talk about some of the research at the interface, which is something that um, Ta Mason actually was looking at in 2004, um, when he talked about um, research that occurs at the, interf the interface of different knowledge systems or different bodies of knowledge. He also talked about um, well, something that we're going we're to mention um, about the intermediaries that can operate between those bodies of knowledge. Um, that's something that we do want to talk about. Um, that was later... Uh, the other piece of work is a, is a piece of work by Angus McFarlane, and I know they're slightly out of, out of alignment, but... Um, and that piece of work, Hiawa Fidia, was also re-emphasised by um, Sir Peter Gluckman in 2011, that those two pieces of work. Um, the other thing I want to do is to um, introduce um, our, our um, steering group that has actually been working with us on this project because we've captured their thinking in, um, by way of video and they're a group that's actually guided us and provided advice for us throughout the duration of this, um, this project. So those people are Angus McFarland and some of you, you may, may know, Sonia McFarland, um, Richard Bedford, Maui Hudson, Graham Cameron, uh, Richie Poulton, uh, Vasantha, uh, Krishnan, um, Sarah, Sarah here. Yep, the back of the next slide. Yep, and um, and I also want to mention Donovan Clark, who was a part of that group as as well. But we are going to watch a video, 
And the approach actually draws from two streams of knowledge. Uh, there's a Western stream uh, and there's Māori epistemologies. So let's say Western science and Māori epistemologies. And for a long time now, one of those streams of knowledge has been the dominant one. What has been experimented with are some metaphors, a metaphor, for example, of uh, a braided river, which is uh, a metaphor that has some meaning for me as a geographer, uh, partly because I was going to be a hydrologist, and braided rivers have particular characteristics. Uh, and one of the characteristics which I liked about the metaphor is that it allows for quite separate and independent assessment of a similar sort of social issue from very different epistemological positions, quite different knowledge systems. And those knowledge systems each being treated with respect. So it's not about trying to fit one knowledge system to work with another, it's about acknowledging that in some contexts, one of those knowledge systems will actually give you, under working within it, will give you far better outcomes than working within another knowledge system. This model is saying that each knowledge system has a richness and a uniqueness of its own. Um, we need to draw from both streams of knowledge. There will be times with this model when um, a Māori worldview or a Māori way of doing things, a Māori way of knowing is the way to go. Um, there will be times when both streams of knowledge will come th together and a shared decision will be made in that space. Um, so for me, the strengths and the benefits of the model is that it enables Māori particularly to have a voice. Um, it gives authenticity to their voice. In the post-settlement environment, iwi have the resources and iwi have the impetus to lead their own development and part of that is research. Uh, and they're no longer really asking or knocking on the Crown's door to assist them in that. So something like um, bridging cultural perspectives or awafiria is essential to uh, how that is going to work together, how iwi, how the Crown are going to work together in the future. And it's a role model, I think, for other communities in Aotearoa, New Zealand. It's really important to keep in mind that our you know, bridging cultural perspectives approach is purpose orientated it focuses on a particular project that is bringing people together to you know, um, either deal with a policy or research issue or uh, develop some kind of um, shared or collective impact. And I think it's really important that people think about who the natural stakeholders for that kind of project are, whether it's uh, iwi stakeholders, mana whenua, um, representatives from relevant Māori organisations, um, other entities. So at times it will be representative, at other times it will be expertise based. So I'm just going to talk a wee bit about um, the basis for uh, and the impetus for, for the project and the setup of it at Superu and also part of and, and how that journey went and, and how we went about developing what hopefully will be a resource and a workshop sort of focus for the future. So the Families and Whanau Wellbeing Research that Supru operates uh, was a program which began uh, in 2012 and some of you may have seen the uh, annual reports we put out on family and whanau, the status of family and whanau. Um, we are literally required to do an annual report and so from the beginning there was that thinking through back in 2012 about what the approach is. The legislation actually uh, just refers only to families, the status of families, and there was a lot of conversation and as Violetta mentioned previously, part of that was to ensure that there was the inclusion of a whānau, conceptual aspect to that, in recognition of uh, the tangaro whenua and uh, the treaty. Uh, so what, what then eventuated, and some of you may have seen this, the separate frameworks that have been developed. So there is a family strand, family knowledge stream, and there's a whānau rangatiratanga knowledge stream. And over from 2013, I think, was our first status report. Uh, there have been progress on that journey in terms of, in 2013 and 2014, focus on developing those two frameworks separately. Uh, and then in 2015, there was the separate reporting based on those two frameworks. The families framework reported based mainly from the uh, data from the census and the general social survey. 
and um, whānau well-being indicators were reported based on the te kūpenga, and there was um, analysis done by um, Tahu and Andrew and Matt, um, and a write-up of, of the chapter relating to that by them. And then in the follow-on year, we started to do further exploration, still keeping the two strands as separate. Now, I took on my role at Superu in oh, late 2014, early 2015, and part of that role was to look across the family and whānau work strands. And when I picked up that role, it was on that platform of a hey our whiria approach. And so when I first having the conversations within Superu about, well, what does this mean in practice? What does this mean for the work program going forward? There were various different perspectives on what that meant. From the two strands being developed separately so that at a certain point they were brought together and then the, the key elements that were common with the strong threads that followed through to, no, 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 you always keep them separate. And then the, if they touch, is there a sharing of knowledge? Is there, a, is there an appropriation of knowledge? What do all those terms mean? And so that brought me back to, the wall brought us back to a discussion within Superua. Well, we need to quite clearly have a think about and work through and articulating what this means for the family and whānau work program. And then not just for the families and whānau work program, but more broadly in terms of the social sector research and evidence base and the conversations between those two knowledge streams. So, what, what, so over the time we worked with the steering group, we had held wānanga, we had conversations and evolved to a model, oops, go back, yes, um, which starting with Hei Aurafiri also drew from the ne negotiated spaces model which has been developed by Linda Smith et al. And their model proposes a platform of conversations that can identify commonalities, tensions and uniqueness across perspectives. And that was a recurring theme as well, the sense that the conversation isn't to reach agreement, the conversation is to discover where there is agreement, where there is difference, where there is uniqueness. Um, and that spoke a lot to the purpose and aim for which um, these activities are undertaken. And that model was developed in response to the need for culturally safe dialogues, models and processes for meaningful conversations. So turning to the model, what I'm going to do next is actually, in having developed that model with the two strands and also some markers for success and identified key challenges in terms of thinking about how one might undertake this approach, just got um, some few messages from the steering group around what they see as some of the cautions in proceeding in something like this. I think one of the concerns with Tanga de Whenua and Hiawa Awaferia is that uh, it is just a way of pulling in our forms of mātauranga and our forms of rangahau for the benefit of the Crown. Um, that has to be dealt with, with cautiously and um, uh, in open relationship. In other words, people have to expect that they're going to get some pushback from from Tangata Whenua, from Iwi, from Māori, in research projects who are concerned about um, the ongoing process of assimilation and of the Crown um, essentially taking Māori forms and Māori knowledge for their own purpose. Te Awafuria can be something else, but if you're not getting that pushback, then you're clearly not in actually real relationship with people. Uh, and I think the pushback is, is precious. I think it's... Uh, Part of what it means to have relationships with people is to be able to conflict with people. And a lot of Māori are unreal with researchers because they know that you're not going to be there tomorrow. Māori groups are often particularly concerned about secondary use of that information. Um, they're often reluctant to get involved because the information they're providing is for a particular context. And if that information is then being stored by an agency or institution, that it's not going to be applied to another project uh, which they're not included in. Um, so the idea of Māori data sovereignty, um, processes of knowledge management and agreeing to kind of particular protocols around access, use, interpretation end up being key discussions that need to be had or, or key issues that need to be negotiated with those, um, with your partners uh, in any particular project. So we're just going to look at some, um, <clears throat> quickly work through some of those key features of this um, approach. And they are, um, yeah, just push them in. Uh, mutual respect and integrity, um, clear and common understanding of purpose, um, an option 
not an obligation, so this is an option, it doesn't have to be an obligation. We've developed an implementation um, process looking at three areas. One is awareness, understanding and application as opposed to just going to application. Um, and also looking at the knowledge broker context and the intermediary, intermediaries as well. So just quickly, um, thinking about the knowledge broker context and intermediaries, there are four uh, sort of contexts in which we have uh, proposed that this approach operates. The first is an, um, as an information intermediary, and that's enabling access to information from multiple sources. Okay, so that's from the different knowledge strands I'm talking about now. Then there's as the knowledge translator. That's not going to work. Yep, and that's helping people make sense of and apply information. And, and, and the families and Fano work that we do at Supru is, is very much located in those first two in terms of both uh, developing the frameworks and um, supporting research and analysis to better understand what Fano wellbeing and what that means and promoting and providing access to that information. As a knowledge broker, improving knowledge use and decision making. Uh, and one of the examples given is the um, conduct, conduct Disorder Advisory Group, where they had brought together information from more of a Western, traditional Western science perspective, and in recognition that their client base was strongly Māori. They also, that's when they spoke with um, Angus McFarlane about, well, what's an approach which can bring in the Te Māori perspective in terms of the work that we're doing? And that is some of the underpinnings around Te Awawhiria, where that looking at both knowledge strands, looking at the commonalities, the tensions and the uniqueness provided more of an innovative way to, to bring the information together to make recommend, recommendations and provide advice around future decision making. The fourth style that we've um, identified is, is the innovation broker and that's changing context to enable innovation and that's probably where we, well, that's where we would place whanau order. As, as, a, as a space where you're actually trying to bring together and make change, and it's a new way of working from having that dialogue. And I guess what this approach is thinking about is what are the ways in which that dialogue has, needs to be undertaken so that there is respect, mutual respect on both sides, integrity, you know, and that there aren't unexpected surprises from either side <laughs> when you're actually undertaking the activity. Um, uh, we too, from next, just quickly, um, <clears throat> we're looking at developing resources um, and piloting those resources using uh, workshops um, and just completing a discussion document around, around the bridging cultural perspectives approach. And I think we're going to end with a... One last video. A benefit from this model is that it enables us to grow the research and the evidence base. We all know that research and evidence informs policy, which in turn informs practice. Um, I believe that policy that is not reflective of a Māori worldview, um, when it's meant to impact positively on Māori, is colourless. It's colourblind policy. So we need to make sure that our policy um, is sharp enough to make a positive difference for the people for whom it's intended. Good social outcomes very much depend on the people for whom the outcome is intended actually accepting the process by which they might be able to improve their lives. And if that process is embedded in some way within their own worldview and their own way of approaching the world, then I think there's a far greater chance of success because process of achieving the outcome will be respected by the people who have to achieve that outcome. And I think that the Whānau Ora program, for example, to a certain extent is an example of an effective way of developing social policy interventions that have relevance for outcomes for Māori. The Awa Whiria is just a start. Uh, to bridging cultural perspectives. I think that um, the diverse communities in our country are, you know, have their own narratives, their own stories, their own research to tell.